good question. Question about other animals. I, there probably are, I haven't looked for those. Ray's specific um, data is plants. That's his specialty is plants. But yes, there are numbers out there. There is research out there about with other animals. Sunwalk to put a couple of mice in a, in a box. Sure, yeah. you, you could uh, okay. just reprogram the agent, yeah. Yeah, there, there's a, something called a JSON file. For those of you who might know what JavaScript is, JavaScript is designed to work with a certain data format called JSON. And we have a web interface to the JSON file that defines the agents. You can just go in and change the word here with the mouse, change the oxygen to carbon dioxide for what a mouse would be, and you're up and running with mice. It takes five minutes. Can we add the numbers for the mice? Uh, I know, but I'm sure, we, no, I, I personally don't know where those are, but I'm sure we can, we can find them, yeah. Yes, can I have a strawberry? <laughs> Other animals. Wow, great question. We just that always happens. The kids always have the and best questions. The question is, don't we have to have other plants? I mean, other animals and bugs to support the plants. And that excellent point, which I completely missed in my talk. Thank you. So one of the things that we've discovered is that the higher order the plant gets, if you go from simple, simple plants all the way up to complex systems like trees, the more they require the support of the biome around them. So it turns out, I just read this article, that a tree cannot by itself, its roots, when it reaches into the ground, that tree cannot convert the, the, the rocks in the, in the soil into mineral by itself. It has to have fungi. And so there's been recent studies done where if you've ever walked out in the woods and you've seen that puffy little white stuff that's above the ground or near the roots, that's fungi. If you take a pinch of it, there can be as much as three miles of fungi strands in a single pinch between your fingers. The fungi's job is to convert the hard minerals, the hard rocks, it actually burrows into it with its tentacles and it converts that rock into minerals and it feeds the minerals to the trees. What does the tree get back from the fungi? What do you think? Yep, it gives sugar. So the tree gives sugar back to the fungi. Yeah. And some plants, some trees, give up to 80% of all the sugar they produce to the fungi and get part of that symbiotic relationship. So if you're doing hydroponics, hydroponics only works if you are replacing those lower order organisms, if you're replacing the fungi and the bacteria and the enzymes. If you're, breaking, if you're providing exactly what that plant needs in solution, if you're taking the minerals and the nutrients and putting it into liquid solution and spraying it on the roots, that plant will do well. But the folks at NASA have told me that's really quite hard. They'd rather just have soil. The soil does it naturally and there's a more of a buffer in the soil. If you make a mistake in that spray mixture, just one mistake, you might kill off your entire, your entire uh, crop. But there's a more of a buffer in the soils because there's more of a delay in, a, 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 a delay in, in the systems. But you can also go really wrong if you get pathogens. The pathogens can wipe out your entire crop. Yes, sir. On the segue into that, what kind of uh, contingencies are there in the catastrophic failure of the plants? So what kind of contingencies for catastrophic failure? You're talking about in the model yeah. or just in the real world? In the real world. I don't know. I don't know what contingencies they have. The only contingency I can think of, and I'm not saying I'm the expert in this, is that I would bring lots of frozen food. I would bring lots of packaged food. <laughs> and have a huge where a huge closet full of food in case my crops fail. In the biosphere too, they didn't have that. They did not have a backup plan. There was no massive store of food. If their crops failed, they failed. Or obviously they could walk out. They were, they were always allowed to walk out. Yeah, so I would bring lots of food. And the benefit to that is that in the trip from Earth to Mars, there will be a lot of radiation on your vehicle. And the best way to protect yourself from radiation is by surrounding yourself, packing, if this was our vehicle, which actually isn't all that different than the BFR, I think. If we would pack the walls with all of our food and water, all of our food and water for the journey would be around the outside because that food and water could absorb a lot of that radiation. So, uh, yes, in the back of the red, oh, in blue, go ahead. So the question is, could the biospherians in Biosphere 2 have survived indefinitely on the diet, knowing that they were hungry but nutrient-rich? 
And my understanding is that they couldn't. They'd just be really grumpy. And, it's, and they would eventually break the lock on the banana door. Um, my understanding is that they were healthy. They were doing fine. And I, I and actually, this is, Cameron, would you mind helping us out here? Cameron is an anthropologist who has a lot of expertise in this. Would you say the hunter-gatherers, were they hungry on a regular basis? Or were they satisfied and satiated in that way? Well, different cultures do have different conceptions of what, 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 you know, what is satiety. What is, what is being satiated, and uh, certainly they have different conceptions of uh, what is painful. So, for example, people in high Arctic, uh, native people in high Arctic, uh, when when uh, one person or when a child is saying, "My hands are freezing," the uh, parent might say, "Yeah, of course they are. It's cold. <laughs> it's normal." Okay, then they stop complaining and they become, and, you know, accustomed culturally to that. But I don't know, chronic. Hunger, the hunger, chronically, that would be pretty rough. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, yes, sir. So I read Scott Kelly's endurance book, and the bulges with the radiation and everything that he experienced being out there for a year in space, um, and his body's not right anymore. I just can't imagine that you're talking about living on Mars and everything, but you got to get there. Yeah, so the, these are good points. So the point, the question or the comments is that the journey to Mars alone is, is just arduous. So you're basically in a giant tin can with no windows. You're not allowed to have windows. Any image you have on the outside is a plasma screen display or an LCD screen because that window would transmit too much radiation in. And so you're right, it's not for everyone. Not everyone wants to do this, but there are fortunately people who find it a, wel a, a welcome challenge and are willing to do it. Um, in terms of once you get to Mars, my understanding is that the, the, the radiation that we've sampled with curiosity is actually much lower than what we thought it was. It's not as bad as we thought. It doesn't mean you get to run around in t t-shirt and shorts every day out in Mars. I mean, you still have to be very careful. Probably most people will be living underground in lava tubes. Or they'll be taking those beautiful domes that we saw and burying them in regolith, burying them in one or two meters of regolith. Uh, in order to stop the radiation. So again, it's not for everyone. But here's, here's a point I'd like to make is that we think, oh my God, how could you possibly live underground or indoors all your life only go out once a week? Well, is that really all that different than how a lot of people live today? <laughs> how many people go from their condominiums to their car in the garage, they get in their car, they drive to the work, they're the covered parking, they go into their office building, they go to the workout center, they're never outside. It's why our kids are going crazy. You know, it's, it's not all that different. We've become a society of indoors people. Maybe Oregon's different. There's a lot of outdoor activities here, like there was when I lived in Colorado. But there's a lot, there's an entire generation of, of kids that are completely comfortable being indoors all the time. And those might be the ones who are comfortable making that journey as well. But it's a completely valid point. I mean, I, I'm not sure I can do it. Yes, sir. Let, let, let's take two more questions, and then if you have additional questions, you can come up and talk to Kyle. And thank you, everyone. I love this engagement. Thank you so much for, for honoring me with all these questions. In your simulation, it seems to cover a lot of you know, the challenges of developing and you know, maintaining a sustainable you know, environment. Is there a portion in there that deals with when it's successful? You know, like the first born generation due to gravity or you know, the lack of atmospheric pressure that might have on a naturally, natively born generation there? So you're, you're asking a good question. The question is after, you know, the model's about the complexities of just getting things to work. What happens when we find a stable solution and we want it to get into the next generation? I, in my vision, in my, in my document that I've written to guide the project, that's in there. It's way out there. But I would love to do it. I would love to do it. And, and again, I'm going to reference my, my colleague Cameron. He and I have had many discussions about putting in genetic code and putting in genetic variation, actually rolling in mutation rates 
so that you can look a hundred generations down the line and say, what will the species become? It, it's fantastic. I'd love to do it, but I, mean, I might be it might be 20 years from now before you get that to work. But yes, it'd be, it'd be really cool to roll that into the system. Now, that's the whole concept of having an age-based model. So it's very flexible. You can quickly re-adapt that model to pretty much be what you want to do once we get this thing running uh, in the way that we believe is correct. And one more. Oh, right here. Oh. I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys afterwards. Go ahead. Um, just a question. You know, we talk a lot about closed systems, but what if you were thinking of an open system? What sort of opportunities do you have for native materials to like, build a bigger habitat? Good question. So the question is about bring everything into Earth versus ISRU, Institute of Resource Utilization. So we know that long term, we will have to use the local resources to the best of our ability. And so that means that maybe we ferry in, as you said, correct terminology, we ferry in the first habitat, the first greenhouse. Ideally, we'd like to set up manufacturing processes. Maybe it's as simple as compacting like rammed earth. And if anybody's ever been in a rammed earth home, maybe we start with rammed earth or rammed Mars soil, and we build structures that are simply compacted soil. But at some point, we'd like to be able to take that soil and extract the minerals, aluminum, zirconium. Steel, all the iron, everything we need to build complex structures. So that is the goal. And, but to do that, we're going to have to bring in a lot of complicated equipment, just like we would if we were developing a, 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 new, a new plot of land. So there are, there's a team that we're working with that is going to do just that. They already have a complex spreadsheet that says, what does it take to support one million people on Mars? And they have all those numbers in that. They're hoping to roll that into our model. So now we have a truly expandable system. Now we've got Sim Mars which will be really fun. Um, so yeah, it's exactly where it has to go if we believe. Now, this gentleman's question is valid, is that we may find that once we get there, we don't have a million people who want to live completely indoors. But as we saw in some of those images that Brian's done, we might be able to build really beautiful indoor, indoor facilities. And with one-third gravity, I'm not a mechanical engineer, but with one-third gravity, my understanding is we can build substantially larger buildings with fewer interior structures. So when I think about, I go to Heath Airport, when I fly through Heath, uh, Heathrow Airport in London, and it's one of the largest buildings I've ever been in with no interior supports. It's, it's got to be 150 meters long. And there's no interior supports. I don't know how they did it. But what if you could be three times larger than that? Well, the ceiling would disappear. And you couldn't even see the wall on the other side of the room. There's a point at which maybe you don't really know if you're indoors or outdoors anymore. I'm not saying it's a replacement for going for a good hike in the woods, but it might get to the point where it's actually quite comfortable. So thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot for coming. If you're a member, please join us for our holiday party.